Action technology allows high-speed or broadband providers to monitor and analyze Internet activity. That information is sometimes passed on to Internet advertisers. Ed Markey of Massachusetts chairs the Commerce Subcommittee on the Internet, and they hold a hearing next about privacy concerns. It's just over two hours. Uh, good morning and uh, welcome to the subcommittee on telecommunications and the internet uh, and our hearing on deep packet inspection technology and consumer uh, privacy and issues that are related to it. Uh, privacy is a cornerstone of freedom. Without question, the digital era in communications technologies will heighten concern about the sensitivity of personal information that can be collected or disclosed about individual citizens and the ever-increasing pervasiveness of such data collection. Obviously, this is happening across our society, from video cameras at crosswalks and federal buildings, checkout scanners in supermarkets, to the collection of information by national security entities and the gleaning of information from a consumer's web use. I have long fought for privacy provisions to be added to our nation's communication statutes to keep pace with changes in technology and markets. I successfully offered amendments that became law in previous Congresses uh, to protect children's online privacy to extend the privacy provisions of the Cable Act to direct broadcast satellite television providers, to add privacy protections for wireless location information, and to strengthen telemarketing privacy protections. In previous Congresses, I also offered legislative proposals to establish a privacy bill of rights for Internet users that would have covered websites like Google, eBay, Amazon, and others, as well as separate legislation that required search engine sites to destroy data collected from users that was no longer needed for any legitimate purpose. And so I obviously have long supported the idea of legislating where needed, and to do so in a way that strengthened and harmonized our nation's communications privacy laws. In this subcommittee, we have direct jurisdiction over the Federal Communications Commission and providers of telecommunications capabilities and services. As such, providers of broadband access to the Internet fall squarely into our oversight role. Today, we look at how so-called deep packet inspection technologies affect consumer privacy and related issues. Following up on letters that ranking Republican Joe Barton, Chairman John Dingell, and I have recently sent raising questions about these technologies. There are a couple of notable differences between the data gathering that individual websites can and do conduct, and that posed by the deployment of deep packet inspection technologies in broadband networks. First, there is a distinction in the detail, the type, and the amount of data collected. As opposed to individual websites that know certain in information about visitors to its websites and affiliates, deep packet inspection technologies can indicate every website a user visits and much more about a person's web use. Second, there are already an array of laws on the books that arguably address a broadband provider's treatment of these technologies and services, including the Cable Act, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, and the Communications Act, amongst other laws. From a privacy perspective, given the sheer sophistication of the technology's capability and the obvious sensitivity of the personal information that can be gleaned from a consumer's web use, I believe broadband providers deploying deep packet inspection technologies must 
adopt clear privacy policies. In my view, consumers deserve at the least, at the minimum, one clear, conspicuous and constructive notice about what broadband providers' use of deep packet inspection will be. Two, meaningful opt-in consent for such use. And three, no monitoring or data interception of those consumers who do not grant consent for such use. Deep packet inspection technologies can be deployed not only with the intent to serve targeted advertisers tailored to a user's web habits. They can also be utilized to manage traffic on the network, detect network threat discovered uh, and, and discover the presence of copyrighted or illegal material and other applications. As a result, these technologies raise not only significant privacy concerns, but also highlight broader policy questions, including how they impact the evolution of the Internet itself and its future prospects for driving innovation and fostering competition and job creation. Today's hearing will allow the subcommittee to better understand the implications of deep packet inspection technologies on consumers, broadband providers, and the broader Internet. We welcome our witnesses to the subcommittee. We thank them for their willingness to be here today. And now I turn and recognize the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Telecommunications and the Internet, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns. Uh, good morning and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the use of consumer Internet information for marketing purposes is not a new issue to all of us. Uh, both the Energy and Commerce Committee and, of course, this subcommittee have previously held hearings to examine a multitude of concerns under the broad banners of online privacy and marketing, including the online collection of personally identifiable information and the use of cookies and other tracking tools. My colleagues, our goal today should be to broadly examine how companies are using consumer Internet behavior to tailor online advertising, both the benefit to consumers as well as any potential concerns that have not already been addressed by industry. The question, why are we just focusing on broadband providers? Why are we not talking about search engines and Internet advertising networks as well? Wouldn't we have the same concerns with those folks? Broadband providers are considering limited trials of tailored Internet advertising. But companies such as Google and Yahoo and Microsoft, all have search engines, have long used tailored Internet advertising. Certainly, we cannot have this discussion without addressing them as well. Whatever the appropriate standards are, I think everybody agrees they should apply to everyone. We can all agree that consumers should be notified, but one of the questions is whether we should require explicit consent through opt-in procedures or whether opt-out procedures are sufficient. That's the core question. Whatever we decide, we need to be consistent. Consumers don't care if you are a search engine or a broadband provider. They want to ensure you are not violating their privacy either way. I'm particularly interested in learning from the witnesses the ways in which the use of behavioral information for marketing has been shown to have already harmed the consumers. It's imperative that there be some evidence of harm if we are going to regulate this practice or we run the risk of prematurely restricting the latest technological advancement that are related to online marketing. As the overall economy continues to take a significant downturn, the government should not be contemplating how to make it harder for small businesses to succeed. <clears throat> Targeted advertising <clears throat> may be essential for small businesses to compete with larger ones. 
They don't have the budget of General Motors or Ford. Small businesses don't have hundreds of millions of dollars to spend on this advertising. So being able to target their ads on the Internet to consumers most likely that use their products give them a better chance to succeed. Overreaching privacy regulation at this time could possibly do more damage to this fragile economy. Companies should be as transparent as possible about what information they collect and how they are using it. That way consumers will be empowered with better information to make obviously better decisions. The Federal Trade Commission began inquiring into targeted online advertising practices with workshops. This effort culminated with it publishing proposed industry self-regulatory principles. Those principles were designed to ensure that companies engage in behavioral targeting voluntarily adopted best practices that provided increased transparency and choice to consumers about these practices. This approach seemed to be working. In fact, the FTC testified in the Senate Commerce Committee, Committee hearing just last week that it continues to believe we have not reached the point where legislation to address online behavioral targeting is immediately necessary. I have a long track record of talking very seriously about this committee's mandate uh, to consider online privacy and marketing issues, which was evidenced by the many hearings I helped organize as my far former role as chairman and ranking member of the Subcommittee on Commerce, Trade and Consumer Protection. I look forward to working with uh, the chairman uh, in continuing that work on privacy issues uh, as a member and ranking member of this subcommittee. I think the hearing is important. I look forward to its results. As we, examine, as we examine these issues today, I hope this panel can keep in mind that premature regulation of such practices, particularly in the absence of evidence of consumer harm, could have a significant negative impact, economic impact, at a time that many businesses, and particularly small businesses, are struggling. So I'll look very closely at these issues before we leap to legislative proposals. Uh, that even the FTC is not calling for at this time. And with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, uh, Mr. Uh, Stupak. Uh, I, I, I apologize. I, 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 I the other gentleman from Michigan, I should have recognized Green. the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green first. Excuse me. Should he be from North Texas or me from South Michigan? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for holding this hearing on the deep packet inspection technology. And I want to thank you and Chairman Dingell and Ranking Member Barton for your leadership and action on this issue over the several months. It's important we look at this issue in light of the recent news regarding Embark and Charter Communications, the potential for invasion of privacy posted by DPI technology if used in the wrong way, extremely troubling. There's necessary and legitimate uses for DPI, specifically for quality of service reasons, monitoring for worms or viruses, used by law enforcement and using it to monitor traffic to the extent necessary to maintain network integrity and prevent congestion in the last mile of the network. <clears throat> Use the DPI by a service provider or network operator to protect network infrastructure and systems is one thing. Using DPI to monitor web users' patterns and habits by th uh, third party to direct advertising or other content their way is a separate and troubling issue. I am most concerned about the privacy implications of targeted advertising based on data collected on Internet users without their knowledge. And our subcommittee has a history of uh, being concerned about it, whether it, a few years ago it was called a cookie or, or whatever. Um, at the minimum, this should be something that a consumer is notified of and must opt into, specifically outside of some agreeing to service terms and conditions. And I can't imagine most of my constituents agreeing to have their uh, activities monitored. Some people may want this kind of information directed toward them, but I and I imagine most of my folks want to know if data being collected on us should uh, and should not have to opt out or install a cookie on our own on our own website browser to print the cl collection of data. The idea that this would take place without the affected consumers or websites knowing it, without consumers having to specifically agree to their information collected and analyzed for uses other than for the network operator to ensure quality service is uh, contemptible. I'm aware Google and Yahoo and others do similar targeting using other technology, and I believe this should be looked into as well, but primary jurisdiction for that falls under another subcommittee. To the extent that we can address privacy issues under this committee's jurisdiction, I believe we can and should. 
again, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for the hearing today on deep pack inspection and I look forward to hearing more about the various uses and impacts it has, both the improved network performance but also the potential privacy implications. And thank you. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing on the deep pack inspection technology. It's important that we discuss the policy implications of this newest advancement in network technology. Applications of DPI technology provide a number of benefits. Internet users are protected from the latest viruses through better filtering security. Network administrators, ha network administrators have more efficient means of managing traffic, and law, law enforcement can use these powerful tools to combat cyber crime. However, while we stand to gain from DPI technology, we need to ensure that the protections Congress has put in place on behalf of a consumer's personal information are upheld. One of our witnesses today, Nebuad, offers targeted and behavioral advertising services by tracking, taking information from the network to create detailed profiles of the internet service provider subscribers. While Nebuad has stated that the information they collect is completely anonymous, they are, there are legitimate consumer privacy questions. Even if the ISPs that partner with Nebuad should be offering consumers an option to opt in for having their data collected, not opt out. If the hardware of the tech if the hardware of the tech network the hardware of the network is configured to collect their data, they are only opting out of having their information sold while it continues to be collected. This is especially important to broadband subscribers with only one choice for an ISP. They do not have the option to choose a different ISP if they feel uncomfortable knowing that the network they are accessing tracks their every move. As broadband providers continue to integrate this technology, will future application of DPI technology be as transparent to the public? Mr. Chairman, thank you again for holding today's hearing. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about the application of DPI technology and its implications, good and bad, for the future of the Internet. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the a uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to wave an opening statement and just add it on to my questions. Okay, then uh, the uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania um, will have that time added to his uh, question period. And seeing no other members here to make opening statements, we'll turn to our panel and we will recognize our first witness, um, Alyssa Cooper who is the Chief Computer Scientist for the Center for Democracy and Technology. Her work focuses on the intersection of computer and networking technologies uh, with consumer privacy. We welcome you, Ms. Cooper. Whenever you're ready, please begin. If you could turn on your microphone, please, and move that microphone a little bit closer. Chairman Markey and members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the Center for Democracy and Technology, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. CDT is a nonprofit public policy organization dedicated to keeping the Internet open, innovative, and free. The legal and policy implications of the technique known as deep packet inspection are of great importance to us. The Internet was built on the principle that data could travel from one end of the network to the other, largely without interference along the way. Likewise, privacy laws in this country were crafted to protect our communications whether they be phone calls, emails, or website visits, from being intercepted in transit. The confluence of technology and policy in this respect was no accident, and it has resulted in the emergence of the Internet that we know and love today, a trusted platform that supports astounding levels of economic activity and individual expression. Deep Packet Inspection, or DPI, could be used in ways that upend this paradigm by giving network operators the ability to intercept and analyze the internet communications of their subscribers. While some uses of DPI technology are benign and even beneficial, others raise serious questions about the future of privacy, innovation, and openness online. Though all of these issues are near and dear to CDT, today I will focus specifically on privacy. The bottom line is this. Certain uses of DPI allow consumers' communications to be centralized, scrutinized, and monetized. Absent careful privacy safeguards, DPI systems run the risk of damaging the consumer confidence in the Internet that has allowed the medium to flourish. DPI has recently been put to a new use, the tracking of consumers' online activities for the purpose of showing them targeted ads. Traditionally, ad network companies have contracted with websites to collect data about consumers. 
In the new model, ad networks partner instead with internet service providers and do their collection using DPI. As it has been implemented thus far, this model poses unique risks to consumer privacy. CDT values advertising as potent fuel for internet growth, and we all cherish the free content that it supports. But ad networks that use DPI may gain access to the bulk of consumers' web browsing activities, including visits to political, religious, and government websites. While traditional ad networks may be large, few, if any, provide the opportunity to collect information as comprehensively as with DPI. Furthermore, most consumers would be quite surprised to find a middleman lurking between them and the websites they visit. The DPI model defies consumer expectations. As several members of this subcommittee have rightly pointed out, the Cable Act's prohibition against collecting or disclosing personally identifiable information without consent is relevant here. We believe that a view into most everything a person does on the web constitutes PII under the statute. So far, cable ISPs have not only failed to obtain consent, but they have not even told their subscribers that their internet communications will be captured and shared with a third party. The Federal Wiretap Act is also applicable. The Wiretap Act prohibits the interception and disclosure of electronic communications without consent. Importantly, the act applies regardless of whether communications are highly personal and sensitive or completely anonymous. Think of it this way. If an eavesdropper were listening in on your phone calls, but didn't know your identity or record the calls, you would likely still feel that your privacy had been violated. The same logic applies to DPI systems. Though consent is merely one of many critical factors in designing a DPI system, these laws raise the question, how should consent be obtained? Notice must be uncomplicated and unavoidable, and it should mention the third party if one is involved. Consent should be expressly provided, not assumed. If a consumer does not consent, her communication should not be intercepted. And consumers should have the opportunity to change their minds, revoking their consent at any time through an easy to find, simple to use process. DPI has not emerged in a vacuum, but rather in a digital environment where more data is collected and retained for longer periods than ever before. Although our communications privacy laws apply to the model I've described today, our nation still has no comprehensive consumer privacy law to protect personal data across the board. Congress needs to take a broad look at both DPI and online privacy concerns at large. Among other recommendations, my written statement suggests that, one, the subcommittee should urge the Federal Trade Commission to address DPI in its proposed privacy guidelines and to exercise its full enforcement authority over online advertising, and two, the subcommittee should set a goal of enacting, in the next year, baseline consumer privacy legislation that would protect consumers from inappropriate collection and misuse of their information. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Cooper, very much. Our second witness is uh, Mr. Robert Dykes. He is the founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of Nebuad, a behavioral advertising firm. Uh, prior to forming Nebuad, Mr. Dykes held senior positions with Symantec Corporation and the Ford Motor Company. We welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Stearns, and other members of the committee. Uh, my name is Bob Dykes, CEO of Nebuad, a recent entry into the online advertising industry. Uh, my objectives today are to recognize that our business process, which involves partnering with the internet service providers, the ISPs, raises legitimate privacy issues. But also, I want to explain how we have addressed those issues and continue to do so, and to enlighten the members of the subcommittee in as much detail as, po detail as possible within the time allotted about Nebuad's service and technology. In doing so, I hope to dispel the many myths and misconceptions that have surfaced about our company. In many ways, I feel like Galileo uh, when he re uh, was viewed with skepticism on demonstrating that the Earth revolved around the sun. Members of the subcommittee, the science exists today and Nebuad is using it to create truly anonymous profiles that cannot be hacked or reverse engineered. And it is possible to provide ISP subscribers prior robust notification and a meaningful opportunity to express their informed choice whether to participate in Nebuad's targeted advertising so that they are in control of their online experience. I come from a security background, serving for many years as Executive Vice President of Symantec Corporation. When we launched Nebuad several years ago, it was at a time when many people had particularly heightened concerns about data security. 
As part of its mission, NEBUAD sought to address these privacy and security concerns. As you will see, NEBUAD systems are designed so that no one, not even the government, can determine the identity of our users. Currently, online advertising solutions and data collection methods operate in many locations throughout the internet ecosystem, from users' computers to individual websites to networks of websites. The NEBUAD service, in partnership with ISPs, provides consumers with significant benefits, serving them with more relevant ads, which they want, while ensuring they have robust privacy protections and control over their online experience. NEBUAD's ad network also is designed to benefit two groups that provide substantial value on the internet. The many smaller websites and general news sites that have difficulty maintaining free access to their content, and the ISPs who need to upgrade their infrastructure to provide increased bandwidth for consumers who increasingly want access to internet-delivered videos. NEBUAD creates these benefits by using a select set of a user's internet activities to construct anonymous inferences about likely interests, which are then used to select and serve the most relevant advertisements. We appreciate that there are groups that would like the internet service pro providers to be like the post office, but ISPs and the many other entities that operate the internet are in fact commercial enterprises, not non-profit quasi-government organizations. As such, they can see that much of the internet is well supported by advertising revenue, and it is legitimate for them to seek ways to also increase their advertising revenues. Neverwhere, Neverwhere enables that endeavor while allowing its ISP partners to maintain their subscribers' trust by giving them control over their online experience. The Neverwhere service is architected and its operations are based on principles essential to strong privacy protection. That is, we provide users with prior robust notice about the service and the opportunity to express informed choice about whether to participate, both before the service takes effect and persistently thereafter. We do not collect or, pers uh, or use personally identifiable information, that's PII. We do not store raw data linked to identifiable uh, individuals. And we provide state-of-the-art security for the limited amount of information we do store. Now, I listened to comments from members of the Senate Commerce Committee last week and to CDT's testimony during that hearing. Immediately after the Senate hearing last week, I made plans to sit down with the CDT to discuss practical solutions to issues they and members of Congress have raised around notice and informed choice. We met yesterday with staff of the CDT for a few hours and believe that a common ground can be reached on a framework that involves prior and unavoidable, simple but complete notice to ISP subscribers about NEBUAD's operations and an easy and obvious means for consumers to express their informed choice both before NEBUAD's behavioral advertising takes effect and thereafter. We also reached a high level understanding on how a mechanism can be designed that would honor consumers' choice not to participate in NIBUED's targeted advertising and not to have information about their browsing behavior flow to our servers. I am extremely encouraged by this uh, and have set a goal of being a privacy leader since I started NIBUED. I will continue to work with CDT on the framework we discussed yesterday and I'm happy to keep members of this committee informed of our progress. In the meantime, we continue to innovate on privacy. NEBUAD last week announced that it was enhancing the industry standard notice options of regular mail and email with a new interstitial or online service which would appear on a user screen prior to the NEBUAD service being activated. We have designed this notice to be easily readable and understandable so that users can exercise informed choice. In addition, we are working with our ISP partners to make users' choice of participating in the service more persistent. The NEBUAD opt-out system is a more robust mechanism than traditional cookie-based opt-out systems, and as a default, users are considered opted out of the NEBUAD system until such time that the system can confirm the consumer has not opted out. So for example, if your web browser blocks cookies, the NEBUAD system will consider you to be an opted out user and will exclude you from the NEBUAD's information collection and targeted ads. Further, we're developing a network-based opt-out and working with ISPs on other mechanisms that can be offered to users to honor even more robust and persistent choice, and these will be able to be configured to ensure that traffic from opt-out users is not diverted. We understand that to gain the public's trust, we need to adopt strong privacy protections. Ours have been reviewed by such entities as the Panaman Institute, and we're engaging in a big four audit firm to conduct an audit to verify that we do what we say we do. This committee has long been involved with the creation of privacy statutes covering the cable and telecommunications industries, as well as specific statutes addressing online privacy for children, telemarketing, and spam. 
them. Yet even these and other privacy statutes have been developed one at a time. There's a common thread running through them all. That is that when more sensitive data is collected and when the collection and disclosure of the data could harm or embarrass the consumer, more rigorous disclosure and consent requirements tend to be imposed. When raw data is linked to identifiable individuals it's, and is stored for longer individuals, there is a, for longer periods, there is an emerging trend that more rigorous disclosure, consent and security requirements should be imposed. NebuEd supports this privacy paradigm, which provides users with uh, consistent expectations and substantial protections. This paradigm also is technology and business neutral, and it is the basis on which NebuEd built its technology and operations. NebuEd urges the committee to maintain both the paradigm and the principle of technology and business neutrality, and we are in favor of a baseline privacy law consistent with that principle. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dykes. <clears throat> Our next witness, Dr. David Reed, is an adjunct professor of engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is affiliated with MIT's renowned Media Lab, where he focuses on communications technologies. And he was also a pioneer in the development early on of the Internet. We welcome you, Dr. Reed. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members, good morning. Um, I, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to testify on this matter, which I think is very important. I have been involved, as you mentioned, since, with the Internet's design and development since 1976 when I joined the Internet Project as one of its architects working with Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn and many others. As one of those who designed the Internet, I feel I have a, a duty to those who use the Internet today and will use it tomorrow. That personal duty, rather than any commercial interest, is why I am here today. Though we all see the Internet, let me set some context that, that relates to its technology and that can explain my testimony. First of all, participating in the Internet as a transporter access provider implies adherence to a set of technical protocols and standards and, techni and, and standard technical practices that are essential for the proper functioning of the collective Internet um, as a whole. Uh, these rules and practices are analogous in many ways to the rules and practices of global banking or international commerce. There is a strong distinction made in that Internet design between information needed to transport Internet datagrams or packets and the information that the end users are request to be transported. This distinction is crucial to the scalability, innovation rate and economic impact of the Internet as well as playing an important role in ensuring the privacy and safety of users of the Internet and limiting liability for the companies that invest in providing the Internet infrastructure. The speed of these of, of digital systems has changed dramatically over the last 30 years and has led to a new innovative technology that allows the inspection of, of packets as they transit the Internet at full speed and in complete depth. This technology, uh, this set of technologies often called deep packet inspection make it possible on a large scale to dig into the content of all end-to-end -end messages at almost any point in the network, do selective recording and analysis of such messages and to modify and to inject messages into the Internet that appear to be messages from a particular source but in fact are partially the result of actions by a third party unrelated to that source and without the ability of the endpoint system to detect the modifications or insertions. These technical innovations are being packaged into applications and sold as solutions to Internet access providers and Internet transport providers by a number of vendors, notably Form, Nebuad, Sandvine and Eloquoia networks, but by hardly limited to those vendors. A subset of these technologies called deep packet inspection technologies targeted at marketing are particularly worrisome because they involve inspection of end user to end user information content, decoding that content and making of inferences about the meaning of that content um, and modifying the content in flight uh, without particularly making that inference or the other activities um, a, a, an, ac a, an aspect of the agreement between the end users on both ends. In, this, in my testimony today, to, I draw several conclusions that Congress may want to consider as it explores use of these technologies. First, 
and this is most important, that DPI technologies are not at all necessary to operating the Internet or to profitable operation of Internet operators. In fact, they actually violate long, long agreed standards and principles of the Internet design. Beginning, or uh, since the beginning, and these, uh, and these principles that have been around from the beginning have led to the Internet's enormous impact and continued success. Second, DPI technologies pose major risks to the economic success of the Internet as a whole. They do so by normalizing non-standard and risky technical activity on the part of telecom operators and broadband operators who may choose to exploit their captive customers rather than transparently deliver the communication services for which their customers have paid. Third, that protecting themselves from the negative impact of these technologies on their private business imposes significant additional costs on the knowledgeable customers of the Internet, of, uh, of Internet transport operators, and on, in, on developers of new Internet services, while at the same time exploiting the unwitting and captive customers uh, of service providers who choose to deploy them. What makes inter deep packet, in well, let me, let me start off by saying it's best to think of the Internet as a shipping service, in some sense a, a, a collection of shipping modes like, like uh, airplanes and, and ships and railroads and so forth that carry packages. Uh, these pack end users put their information in these packages, which will be called packets, and put addressing information on the outside of the packet, um, and they present them to a shipping agent who chooses a path and a set of warehouses along the way that might be called routers that deliver these packets. Um, the deep, what makes deep packet inspection deep is the use of this technology to collect and modify the internal contents of these packages, as if um, there were a high-speed X-ray technology that was able to examine packets without changing them, and also high-speed uh, manufacturing technology that can actually open up the packets, manufacture something new, stick it in, and send it along. And I think that analogy is actually very strong. Uh, note that it's unnecessary for the carriers to look inside the packages to do their job. This separation of concerns that was built into the Internet, that of transport versus um, packet access, is part of the, the economic success of the, of the, of the Internet and also part of the privacy functionality that was built in from the beginning. There should be no reason to look inside these packets. One more thing about the Internet that is different is that the Internet is constructed based on protocols or, or, or conversations between the endpoints. And uh, these protocols are an understanding between the end users, not, not the end users and their carrier. When DPI systems make inferences about packet contents, they do not have access to the, uh, to the meaning that is intended by the endpoints of those protocols. And because of that, it poses significant risks. And with that, I'll, I'll finish here and await your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reed, very much. And our, our next witness is Mr. Bijan uh, Sabet. Uh, he is a general partner at Spark Capital, a venture capital fund focused on the media, technology, and entertainment industries. Mr. Sabet has led numerous investments in startup technology companies and has worked for Apple Computer. We <coughs> welcome you, sir. Uh, please begin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I'm from Boston, but I'm a Yankee fan, so please don't hold that against me. <laughs> um, Thank you for hope helping us to win the All-Star Game so the final game in the World Series can be at Fenway Park. We thank all the Yankee Four, five players for helping us. Okay. Can you move that microphone just in a little bit more closely, okay. please? Thank you. All right. Well, um, my name is Bijan Sabat. I'm a general partner at Spark Capital based in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, Spark Capital, as you said, is a venture capital firm, and we are managing and investing uh, in excess of $620 million. Uh, we make direct investments in early stage companies in the internet, media and technology industries. Uh, to date, we have made 25 investments in this area. Uh, we are being very aggressive uh, and probably will be over 30 companies next year. And our companies are, are generating real value, real technology, real revenue and real jobs. Uh, deep packet inspection is something I care a great deal about as well as my partners and will directly impact the Internet ecosystem which is beginning to thrive. 
as a technology, I believe there's nothing wrong with DPI. It's a significant technology breakthrough, and up until fairly recently, DPI could not be achieved at scale at any reasonable cost. <clears throat> so I, I don't have any criticism about Nebuad specifically or any of their uh, vendors that have uh, DPI technology. The issue at hand is how DPI is implemented and how it's managed. It's less about whether these vendors have certain features or not. It's about uh, what can and cannot be used, done with DPI. So to start off, uh, just a quick definition of DPI. I, I think Wikipedia cites it well when it states that deep packet inspection or sometimes complete packet inspection is a form of computer network packet filtering that examines the data or header part of packets as it passes an inspection point searching for a non-protocol compliance, viruses, spam, intrusion, or predefined criteria to decide if the packet can pass or if it needs to be routed to a different destination for the purpose or for the purpose of collecting statistical information. This is in contrast to shallow packet inspection, usually just called packet inspection, which just checks the header portion of a packet. So we need to understand the impact of DPI. Uh, DPI can provide significant economic and consumer benefit if used correctly, but it can cause significant problems if used incorrectly. There are really two issues to consider. One is privacy, which I think uh, Dr. Reed and Ms. Cooper uh, summarized very well, and I largely agree with them. I, I think the other issue is, is how, how DPI relates to the open Internet. My interest in providing this testimony is less about privacy, per se, and more about DPI's impact on the open Internet and the Internet ecosystem. The important question is, do we want an open Internet or a closed Internet where ISPs can decide what content and applications should be available? Specifically, should ISPs decide if a competitor's product will be able to flow to the home or not? That's just one example. That's the topic I'd, I would very much like to discuss with all of you. We have all seen the explosion and growth of the Internet in the business and consumer markets. It's been a large success. High-speed Internet to the home has fueled this growth with applications such as Apple iTunes, Google's YouTube, joint ventures such as Hulu by NBC and Fox. Uh, this world is moving quite fast. Consider Netflix, which was once only a mail order DVD rental company, is now streaming full-length movies on demand over the Internet. Thus, impact of high-speed Internet has just begun. Hundreds and hundreds of startups by venture capitalists like myself are, are investing in this space because entrepreneurs and investors alike see the value in the open Internet. And while the Internet is growing rapidly and investors are pouring money into the new ideas and new opportunities and new businesses and new jobs funding new technology, U.S. broadband penetration is not as good as it should or could be. The chart I provided in my testimony is from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and it shows that as recently as 2007, the United States was ranked 15th in terms of broadband penetration. So we're behind many countries such as Canada, France, Germany, Korea, Iceland, Denmark, etc. The other interesting note here is there's not a very good definition of what's high speed or broadband access. Up until recently, broadband in this country was defined as 200 kilobits per second, which by today's standards would not be considered high speed data. Hopefully, we would all believe that it is our economic self-interest to explore ways to make the United States a leader in high-speed Internet access. We need more applications and user benefit, consumer benefit, to increase broadband adoption in the United States. We need lower cost of service and we need a national coverage plan. The open Internet and growing broadband penetration are the key economic drivers of the Internet ecosystem and economy from my perspective as a venture capitalist. And that brings me back to the topic of DPI and its potential negative impact on the open Internet. Many are calling this topic of the open Internet and DPI a discussion around network neutrality, which is the principle about an open network with restrictions potentially only for legal purposes. The danger is that ISPs would and could use DPI as a way to turn off or slow down third-party applications or third-party services. Recently, the FCC discovered that this was happening with, large, with a large ISP and a third party. In this case, it was a startup called BitTorrent. We don't have to imagine what would happen if ISPs continued to do this. We have only to look at the mobile industry. Many venture capital firms like mine are investing in the mobile space, but cautiously compared to the open internet sector. Why, why are we doing that? 
Well, consider that the biggest success startup stories in the last 15 years, and the vast majority of them were companies that were a result of the open Internet ecosystem. Ask yourself, which startup companies have created billions of dollars of value and thousands of jobs in the mobile space? There are a few, but these examples are far less than those that are coming from the open Internet ecosystem. That is because the mobile Internet, the mobile system, is closed. There is no ecosystem in the United States. Carriers are able to block websites. They are able to block third-party applications and services. And as a result of this closed network, most consumers in the United States are not signing up for Internet access on their mobile phones, which means a less attractive market for innovation, a less attractive market for investors, less attractive market for entrepreneurs. Mr. And the cycle Sebeck, could you summarize, down. please, yep. as possible? So we need a healthy and growing broadband market in the United States. I would like to see our cable companies and telephone companies thrive and grow their businesses with new technology and capabilities, and new applications will help them sell services too, but it should not be at the consumer's expense or the Internet ecosystem's expense. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Sabet, very much. And our final witness, uh, uh, Mr. Scott Cleland, is a founder and president of Precursor LLC, research and consulting firm. He blogs and speaks frequently on issues related to the Internet economy. We welcome you, sir. Mr. Chairman and members, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I am Scott Cleland, President of Precursor LLC, an industry research consulting firm. Full disclosure, I am also Chairman of NetCompetition.org, which is a pro-competition e-forum funded by telecom, cable, wireless and broadband companies. My testimony today reflects my personal views, not those of my clients. I believe the real problem here is, the, um, is not necessarily the, uh, the prospect of deep packet inspection, but the current patchwork of U.S. privacy laws, a lack of a holistic approach to Internet privacy, and the selective oversight of privacy problems. I believe they all combine to create a, um, perverse incentives for some companies to arbitrage privacy laws and to push the privacy envelope. As a result, Abuse of privacy is among the most serious problems that face users of the Internet. I believe the lack of a holistic, comprehensive and balanced approach to privacy law and oversight is a serious threat to Americans' privacy. Now, broadband companies have long been subject to strict privacy laws, Section 222, 551 and the ECPA. These laws create serious consequences for the misuse of private information um, without a user's permission. Consequently, broadband companies have developed extensive policies, practices and procedures to respect users' privacies and protect private information. Now, the subcommittee's oversight of deep packet inspection uh, for advertising purposes is very appropriate, and existing laws, I believe, appear to cover these practices. What I'm concerned about is, is that the selective oversight of only broadband privacy matters fosters a blind eye to the arbitrage of privacy laws by companies like Google, Yahoo and others. This creates a perverse incentives for companies not covered by U.S. privacy laws to push the envelope on privacy to gain competitive advantage. Now, Americans' privacy should not be an unrestricted commodity to sell to the highest bidder or to gain competitive advantage. Specifically, I'm troubled with the broadband focus of this hearing because privacy is a cross-cutting, big-picture uh, issue that knows no boundaries between the application, the transport, the, um, or the content layers of, of the Internet. By turning a blind eye to Google, which I believe is the worst privacy, privacy offender on the Internet, it is systematically invading and abusing Americans' expectation of privacy. Now, this hearing I, I, my, uh, my feeling about this hearing is it's here to create fear about what broadband providers could do, while it's ignoring what Google and others are actually doing today that hurts Americans' privacy. Now, the irony here is the worry about whether broadband privacy um, blinds are perfect when the Internet house has no privacy walls at all. Let's consider the depth and the breadth of the intimate blackmailable information that Google already collects on you. Everything you've searched for, everywhere you've gone on the web, 
what you watch through YouTube, what you read through Google News FeedBurner Blogger, what you say in your emails, what you produce in Google's Docs, what your family and friends look like through Picasa, your medical conditions and history through Google Health, your purchase habits through Checkout, your call habits and voice prints through Google Talk, your travel habits and interests via Google Maps, your interest in places through Google Earth and, and Street View, your personal information through Orkut, Gmail, Checkout, and, and others, where you go and hang out, which will come through Android, where you'll be or where you were through Google Calendar. The scale and scope of Google's unauthorized web surveillance, and I use that term, that should be as concerning to people as deep pack and inspection, unauthorized web surveillance. And I, I commend the chairman today in the Washington Post for talking about this. He said, surreptitiously tracking individual users' internet activity uh, um, cuts to the heart of consumer privacy. I couldn't agree more with the chairman on that. So while this is uh, truly Orwellian Big Brother stuff, while, the government, while Google is not the government, uh, all this information that Google collects is on Google's servers. It is not on your PC where you, where you own it. And it's available to the government via subpoena. So in sum, information is power. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Google's market power over private information is corrupting Google. Just like a former FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, was corrupted by his power and mastery of personally sensitive information, Google's unprecedented arbitrage of privacy law, combined with its exceptional lack of accountability, is fast creating this era's privacy-invading, unaccountable equivalent, which I call J. Edgar Google. Remember the timeless insight. Those who um, don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Great, uh, great. and uh, thank you, Mr. Cleland, uh, very much. Now we're going to turn to questions from the uh, panel. And I want to begin by agreeing with Mr. Cleland that uh, uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So Mr. Dykes, not only do you get access to all of Google, but you get access to all of eBay's, Amazon, everyone. If there, were, if there were 56 companies up here, not just Google, but everyone else had a company, you'd get access to all of the information. So you are, you are Google times 100 in terms of the information you can, with this deep packet inspection coordinating with a broadband carrier, get access to. So I'd like to get crystal clear, Mr. Dykes, what your privacy position is. And I would like a simple yes or no, please. One, um, do you support giving consumers clear, uh, conspicuous notice? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Two, do you support a meaningful opt-in standard for authorizing use of a consumer's data? Well, I, sir, I, I would say that uh, to, to characterize opt-in or opt-out is, is probably not, as, not as, as important as to say there has to be a very robust notice. No, no, no. The difference is that you've got to get the consumer to say yes, okay? Do you support a policy that says the consumer must say yes before you're allowed to roam through all of their personal data and turn it into an information product? Uh, which is then sold to other companies. Yes or no on that question? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think you're forcing me into one of those, have you stopped beating your wife recently? No, 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 no. Have you stopped beating the consumer is the question, okay? And I want to know, <laughs> well, Mr. Exactly, Dykes, sir. do you support getting permission from, uh, affirmatively from the consumer before you start beating them up by sending them products, sending them other information that they Mr. have Chairman, not asked for. Mr. Mr. Dykes, Mr. Chairman, yes or no? I, I, really, I really must protest and say that, that it's much more important to ensure that the consumer is well informed on the decision being made than to use the... Oh, I already asked that first question. Out. You already answered that one. That's yes. Now I want to know with, what you with, mean with by an, that. And by, and by that, that's should you get permission from the consumer First, Mr. Dykes, you have absolute power, as Mr. Cleland just pointed so, out. So, so You're going to have access to all the information. Do you, do, Chairman, do you want to give them, uh, do you want to give them, um, uh, do you, will you give them opt-in? 
Mr. Chairman, I, I, I really have to say that, that how what we do is, is, is characterized uh, is, is going to be characterized by others. All right, let me ask you the third question. Do you agree that consumers who do not grant consent should not have their web use tracked, intercepted, or profiled? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, we in fact have, have explained uh, that recently we, we have uh, created innovation that will enable that. So that's a yes. They should not get information if they have not granted consent. That's right. If they have opted out, for example, they should not be tracked. Uh, no, I'm not yes. saying that. I'm saying if they have not granted consent, should uh, that they should not have their well, web it, use tracked. As, as we go through this, this process of, of informing them, uh, if, if we're not convinced, and that's true today, if we're not convinced that somebody has uh, has not opted either way, then we're then you're, not are you going to you're going to then consider that to be consent if they have not, uh, if, not if they have not opted either way, then they're not tracked. For example, if somebody has deleted all their calls, well, I don't think that's a high problem. enough standard, Mr. Dykes. I, I think that that's basically saying that that uh, that uh, silence is consent and that as a result no, you can do whatever you want with their information. I don't think no, unless just, you've got their that. affirmative permission that you should be allowed uh, to be able to take this uh, incredible leap into the breaching of the privacy of Americans. It's like saying that, you know, the mailman can open up any letter, can open up any package, you know, find out what's in it and then start to partner uh, with uh, other companies letting them know what uh, individual Americans are receiving in the mail, what kind of packages are coming to their house. But it's okay because the consumer doesn't know that you're doing it uh, and hasn't given you the opportunity to say to the mailman, stop opening my packages, stop opening my mail. I don't want anyone to know about it. And so we've got a real problem here. Ms. Dr. Reed, can you tell me, uh, sir, how this uh, uh, concept is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, consistent uh, with the history of the Internet, or inconsistent with the history of the Internet? I'm sorry. I, sure, I, sh I should clarify that the definition of deep packet inspection used by Mr. Sabat is not quite right. It doesn't involve only looking at um, label information. It does indeed look, involve looking at everything in the packet. Um, so the Wikipedia is wrong, as, as sometimes it is. Um, the, the, what's inconsistent about the history of the Internet, the history of the Internet was designed with the, the shipping of goods and, and essentially the ideas that lurk behind common carriage as, as its uh, um, uh, background. And, and it relates to the idea that um, the only people who should be interested in the actual contents of, of these messages are the endpoints involved that uh, that are addressee or source of the of the message, um, and we carefully chose that design in the original design because we didn't want to make the network more complex. And we knew, and uh, a and b, we knew that uh, the internet it was the first network that had multiple jurisdictions um, involved in the transport of. Packages. AT and T had only one, was only one company, but the packages in the internet flow through many autonomous systems, all of which could potentially um, cause trouble to the endpoints and and which are not under control of a central authority. So the um, the reason we built into the design that that contents of the packages was sacrosanct from both examination and action um, was specifically to deal with the diversity of the network and to deal with the expectations that could be standardized at the endpoints, that when you send a packet, it would get there with best efforts. That was the fundamental principle of, of and, and, and without examination. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Uh, my time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dykes, uh, I can give you a little help on your answers for Mr. Markey. You can say, I don't know. We oftentimes have no, members. No, I, I think the way uh, Mr. Chairman further explained it, I think the answer would actually be yes, uh, that, that we do not track people who we are convinced don't want to be tracked. Um, obviously, if the chairman uh, wants to say every time this occurs there has to be an opt-in, uh, then a dialogue box would come up all the time. and. Uh, 
I'm saying that if, if Congress mandated that, isn't it possible that when I go on the Internet and whether we're doing uh, deep pockets of information exploration or whether we're doing, as uh, Mr. Cleveland talked about, unauthorized surveillance, a dialog box would pop up. Isn't that true under what Mr. Markey, Mr. Chairman, there would be a constant dialogue box and every consumer would have to click in, click out. I mean, and that would, would happen. Well, well, I mean, give me the practicality if we went along the reasoning that Mr. Markey is saying is we need to have an opt-in every time something happens, whether it's a surveillance. Because Dr. Reed made a very good point. He's making the analogy between sending a box from Europe to the United States and there's an address on this box. And we're supposing you let your company go into the box, and uh, there's an implication, Dr. Reed, say that you're mussing up the box. So you've got to make the case here strongly this, this morning that this is not the same analogy, and that the personal identifiable information has nothing to do with health, it has nothing to do with financial records. The compilation that Dr. Mr. Cleveland is talking about is onerous, and there's lots of stuff coming together. I understand that. But, uh, the only way they can get back to it is through an IP address, and you've got to be very clever to do that. But some of the things you're doing are very simple things that you're trying to say, does Stearns enjoy this type of DVD? Does he like this movie? Or does he like such and such? And maybe we'll advertise to let him know there's a new war novel coming out that he might like. So, I mean, you're on the, on yes. the pivotal point here, whether opt-in or opt-out. This is the key question. So. You got to make the case, and maybe uh, Mr. Cleveland, you could comment too. It's, so, you know, the, the laws, the, uh, the Congress over time has balanced a whole series of factors in deciding what laws require opt in. And opt in is actually pretty rare. It's, you know, really when there's a sensitive information, uh, a personal information that could harm or embarrass somebody. And so we made a particular point of not having any personally identifiable information, not having any sensitive information. And so by staying at a very high level, broad categories characterized against anonymous profiles, we believe that in the general sense of the law uh, that, this, uh, uh, that, that this country has, we're really in the opt-out mode. But I really don't think that opt-in or opt-out is nearly as important as robust notice to the consumer so that they truly understand what is, what is uh, going on and then the opportunity to control that. So uh, obviously don't, you don't want to be too intrusive with the notices. But I think there was a... Well, a tell me, how are you giving notices set. today that while your company is uh, working? Today, how do you give notice to the average consumer? Yeah, t today, uh, our ISPs uh, generally give notice by either a, a separate letter in the mail or a separate notice in the billing statement or an email. When they Does that come notice. before or after you've gone through the deep pocket? Be 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 before. Uh, we, we say we, we need to have the notice happen at least 30 days before uh, any of the service commences so that we can be sure that people have the opportunity to opt out and people do opt out. People so you're saying you already have an opt out notice in place? Uh, yes, sir, we do. We have these notices and these are the notices that, that in general privacy rules are considered to be very robust notices today. We're going to go beyond that though and we've introduced, uh, are introducing technology to allow that notice to be online if, uh, okay. and, and we'll uh, work with CDT to improve that process and ensure that we find a way to, uh, to, to meld the needs of privacy with users' expectations and, uh, okay. and good users. Mr. Cleveland? Uh, thank you. Um, the, the point I want to, um, want to reiterate is broadband companies are already subject to strict privacy laws. They respect privacy laws. They have cultures that embed policies, practices, and procedures that respect privacy. That's the law. My point here is we're, we're, we're worried about whether the, um, where the, whether the blinds on the window are perfect when the house doesn't have any walls. And so people are worried about you know, broadband and deep packet inspection that is covered by the law and there is oversight like this hearing and there's regulators that can look into it, yet what happens um, with Google and Yahoo and some of these others is there is no privacy law and there is no oversight and so there's huge arbitrage. Dr. Reed, and then we'll just complete. May I just comment that um, two broadband providers, um, one, one noted in this document from Robert Topolsky of, uh, who works with Free Press and Public Knowledge. Um, and another charter communications in the United States are considering using 
or have used, so they've already violated the privacy law if the privacy laws apply, or are considering using this technology with American citizens with whatever is going on. And form technology has been actively operating a very similar service based on similar technology um, in partnership with British Telecom in the UK. So it's a little bit unreasonable to claim that the uh, providers feel they are constrained from using this technology by those laws today. They may, maybe they haven't consulted their legal departments. Gentlemen, <laughs> gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dykes, uh, if, if, I'm, if you're on one of the ISPs, how do I know? How am I given notice that uh, uh, your, your company is tracking my information? Uh, uh, today, sir, we provide notice via a... You provide notice or the ISP? Uh, the ISP provides notice via a, a separate note in your billing statement or separate letter, or if they're confident that it will be read uh, an email to you. Uh, but as I said uh, previously, we're now introducing newer technologies so that notice can be online, uh, so you can read it directly there as well. And if, if I opt out and I don't want to be part of this program, you can still track everything I do and every site and where I, my interest might lie, no, correct? Well, the, the very point of you opting out is that we then don't do that. Uh, and, and if we were already doing it and you opted out, we immediately delete all of the records that we have on such an opted out. And, and you don't track after that? Correct, sir. We don't collect any data once you've opted out. We delete all the data that we might have had. But by providing that notice 30 days before the system begins uh, in your neighborhood, uh, there's a good chance that it never would have been uh, collected. What if people don't return don't respond, you just start tracking them? So uh, th that is why uh, that we make sure that we're not collecting any personally identifiable information. Nor so the answer is if I don't respond, I get tracked? Uh, so that, that is the way the, the, the general privacy laws are written today is that where there is no personally identifiable information or sensitive information. Why well, do you think most Americans would, would, would state that's not the law? I think most Americans would believe that the information they have about themselves is theirs. Just because I belong to an ISP doesn't give you the right to track me. If I want to be tracked, I sh it should be affirmative. As I said in my opening statement, it really should be an opt-in. Well, why do I have to opt out? Why should the burden be on the American consumer? Should it not be on uh, the ISP or your company that wants to track my information? Well, sir, uh, I, I, I think that, uh, that there should be a common set of laws around uh, privacy in this country that, that uh, generally uh, treats various technologies in exactly the same manner. Uh, you know, what we do with the Internet uh, or offline, etc., should have a common set of principles, and I don't think that one set of, of companies should be penalized versus another set of companies. But given a general law, we are very happy to comply with however that law is set up. So if we pass a law that says you can't do in deep pack unless the consumer actually opts in, you'd be satisfied with that? Well, uh, we would be satisfied with any law you pass, sir. So we okay. work within that. Okay. Um, Dr. Reed, um, you spoke about how deep pack technology can be used to assist law enforcement, but you also expressed concerns regarding how it may negatively affect the network's ability to function. Uh, how do you reconcile the two? Yes. In specific law enforcement? Yes. Or, well, first of all, I, it, it, there are two things going on here. Law enforcement uh, use of these technologies, which is in some cases mandated by CALEA, uh, Correct. while you, you've passed, um, generally only inspects the packets generally uses those uses the information derived from those packets in um, legally sanctioned ways and I presume is using um, the rules of the government to guard and, and safeguard that information and how it's used so while I'm so law enforcement I'm, more, more goes for an information packet from there if there's reason to believe a crime may be committed that's when they go deeper to identify the individual well, in fact, the um, a num number of these technologies, I believe, are used currently by law enforcement selectively and by intelligence agencies on foreign traffic sure, like constantly. 
Um, and those, those technologies are um, collecting the information, but in very safeguarded locations, um, government owned or controlled locations. Um, the analysis performed on them is subject to review by, um, by various processes ranging from, uh, you know, so they're not just used immediately to react. And the review is a legal review in many cases where, um, for example, the standards of evidence are required to actually act on that information. So a, a, uh, an FBI agent may in fact be using deep packet inspection sure. derived information, but whether it can be presented in court or used for exploration, those are matters that I'm not, and not being a lawyer, de not deeply expert in, but my understanding is that that's quite a different kettle of fish than here. I don't think commercial companies are in, in the, have the ability sure. to carry out such a duty of care. Are, are, are DPI devices accessible remotely? Uh, in other words, I mean, are they susceptible to hackers who may wish to commit identity theft, in your estimation? They could be. I have not examined them. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to examine, for example, Nebuad's devices and technology, but, but what I know about them is based on observing, you know, observations by people who detect them in the network and an analyze them as black boxes as, as based on what they do and what they seem to do, plus their marketing materials. And I, I have no specific knowledge of how easy it is to break into them. I, I, I believe uh, uh, Mr. Dykes is correct that, that you can make them quite secure if you put that amount of energy into them. Um, but nearly every technology can be broken. Great. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the hearing on, on this uh, very important matter, I think, and I concur with the chairman's comments and others that uh, I think the average consumer out there views this more or wants to, their, their time on the Internet more like they view the postal system, and I realize that's in disagreement with some on the panel, but I thought the chairman hit it on the head. You know, if I order a package from some site, I don't ex expect the postal person to go through it on the way, figure out what it is, and I thought it was a great analogy, Mr. Chairman, and then decide who they think ought to come and market me. And that's different than walking into a store and realizing I'm public um, and shopping around, I think. Uh, and, and so I, uh, I think for the Internet to really survive as an engine of commerce, you have to have opt-in. And I think that's what consumers want. That's what I'd want. I get enough junk mail. I'm not sure I'm going to plow through every letter I get or every whatever it is you're sending. Do you have a copy of what you send out, by the way, Mr. Dykes? Yes, sir. We can provide that to you. I'd love to see it. But, you know, the fact that I have to take affirmative action so that I can stop you from making money on my transactions on the Internet seems sort of backwards. And isn't that really what you're saying I have to do? I have to opt out under your scheme. So, so I, as I said, I think it's most important that we inform you what we're doing. That, so that's, that's, that we do that, what? That we inform you of what we're doing. Robust information, uh, a notice that, that you can clearly understand what is happening, uh, and then you can make your choice. Uh, but, why, you know, the, the, but why is the burden on me to make the choice? Because the choice you're asking me as a consumer to make is to prevent you from taking an action that enriches you, right? So the, you're a I mean, you're in this big money. That's not a bad thing. But isn't that you're building a business model here? And aren't you sort of in part betting on the come that there are going to be consumers who ignore those notices or don't understand them or, or whatever? So you get to work that angle. Plus those who affirmatively say, you bet, I like your concept. And there will be some who say, yeah, update me on the latest from whatever organization. So the, the, the Internet is, is not like the post office in as much as it's actually run by commercial organizations. And, and the ISPs have noted that more than half of the Internet funding is coming from advertising today. And I think it's a legitimate desire on their part to increase the amount of advertising that they receive to help fund the Internet. And so this is a manner to do it with very robust privacy controls. So that, but wouldn't the most, most important. I'm sorry. Wouldn't the most robust privacy control be that of opt-in? Well, as long as we're not collecting any personally identifiable information or sensitive information, then, then we believe it is possible to, to note uh, innocuous commercial categories mapped against anonymous profiles so that there's no consumer harm in that regard and, and then drive additional value from that. But, but you have the ability to personally 
uh, track identifiable sensitive information, right? You could get access to that. The, well, the, we can't get access to any secure information. If it's an HTTPS transaction, for example, it's just physically not possible for us to track secure transactions, such as when you go to your bank. So no, sir, we can't track everything. But if, if you're an internet uh, consumer and you're just looking at different sites, you're planning a vacation somewhere, and so you go to the site on the Virgin Islands or Crater Lake Lodge in Oregon, you, you could track that I'm looking at that site. That, that's an example where we wouldn't then keep track of the fact that you went literally to that site. We'd, we'd note the fact that you're interested in travel. Would be an example right, but, that but you would know out. who I am. Uh, no, we do not know who you are. You just know that my, my uh, IPS address? We don't keep the IP address either, sir. But you have access to it? We don't keep it. We don't. That's a different question. Do you, do you ever have access to it? Uh, what we do with the IP addresses is we translate them immediately in real time to uh, an anonymous identifier so that in a one-way uh, uh, cryptology so that we can't find our way back to the IP address. So we don't have access to the IP address. Dr. Reed, is that, is that track? I'm not questioning what yeah. you're saying. I'm just trying to figure out how all this... I, a lot of it's uh, actually, me and a lot of people. Actually, so. the, the, there's a distinction that I'm making that... Mr. Dykes may not be making, which is that he's talking about the internet, including all the services that are on the internet, such as Google and so forth. And I'm speaking specifically of the transport part of the internet. Um, it is the case that banks, for example, while they take your password um, over a secure link, present things like account information and so forth using HTTP transactions in the clear. So the that's not true of all banks, but one, it relates to the point I made earlier about the extra expense. If the banks were to respond to, uh, properly to this and to their mandate to keep consumer privacy pri information private, they would have to start using encrypted links for far more than they're currently using them for. Um, and we could have an escalation on, on encryption. Uh, we might have an encryption war, at which point if every tra piece of traffic were encrypted, there would be no market for uh, right. NebuAd services. I don't, I, I think there are policy implications of having all the impl in traffic encrypted, and I'm not sure I want to go there, but, but the user at great cost to themselves and the services could avoid this problem and it just shifts I, the, the problem elsewhere. Gentlemen, and, and I, I My time's run out, I know. I just have a, a unanimous consent request. I know the ranking member had sent letters to uh, the, the uh, chairman of, of Google, and I wondered in 07 and 08 if I could just ask for those to be put in, in the record. Without objection, they Thank will you, be Mr. included chairman, in the record. And I, and I would say to the gentleman from Oregon as well that, you know, uh, Mr. Dyke said that the postman is a public and he's private, but. FedEx and UPS are also private, but they can't open up our packages. They can't open up the mail that we put inside. You know, they're, 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 they're private too, but we all have an expectation when we put something in FedEx that exactly. Mr. FedEx can't open it up before he puts it at, the, at, at our front door. So let's not confuse that issue. Okay, it's the same level of privacy expectation. Let me turn now and recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, I, I think the post office analogy is, is, is important because it's a way most Americans uh, can relate to what's going on. I mean, uh, uh, people would be shocked if they thought the post office or FedEx or anybody else was looking what's inside their packages, whether they know who they were or not. People would be shocked to know that. And, you know, this all gets down to what it, it implied consent. Uh, Mr. Stearns talks about a dialogue box popping up every time. You'd have to say whether you want to opt in or opt out. It, would, it doesn't need to be like that at all. Uh, it, it really should just be with the Internet service provider. When I subscribe to America Online or when America Online changes its privacy policy to accept your service, Mr. Dykes, there should be something that pops up on my AOL site when I go on saying Our, something's changed. Uh, or if I'm just a new subscriber, here's, here, and, and it should ask me clearly whether or not I want to be in on a service that's going to look at my information and possibly share that uh, with other people and do I want to do that or not. And if I say no, I don't want anybody knowing where I go online or what I'm doing or if I travel uh, or if I'm going and, and looking up uh, information on uh, prostate cancer, I don't want anybody to know that, that I can just check that no box and, and I don't have to do anything after that. Any site I visit 
I'm saying I don't want anybody to be inspecting that packet. It could be a simple one opt-in, opt opt-out uh, that, that is presented to you. Now, I've seen these. I, I don't know anybody that reads their damn privacy okay. statements in their bills. I mean, if you ever saw them, I've looked at them a couple times. Your bill comes. There's a, a, a couple pages. You know, they're on that real thin paper that's, that's folded. It's about a two font print, you know, and if, if you're old like I am, you can't even see it. And, and then you're, you're going through that with a magnifying glass and somewhere in there, I guess it tells you that if you, you don't want somebody to, to be able to know where you're going, to check some sort of, you know, opt out. But, but if you want to, the, the big print says if you want to enhance your experience on the internet, you know, then just we'll take it from here and you don't have to do anything. We're going to make sure you have a great experience on the internet. People don't know this is happening. People do not know that they're implying their consent by saying nothing or the fact that they don't read the fine print uh, in these boxes. And, and the idea that, that anybody can, can examine where you go, what you say, anywhere, uh, without expressly saying it's okay with me, I think uh, goes against everything that, that the country has been founded on and what most Americans understand uh, as their right to privacy under the Constitution of the United States. And I don't care whether an Internet service provider is doing it or Google's doing it, 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 it shouldn't happen. And, and there, there should be a clear policy where Americans say, I want this, and it, and it should be right up front. And it doesn't need to be a box on every website you visit, just your, your, your ISP when, when, when you're looking at it. Um, well, now I'll ask some questions. Yeah, well, yes, go ahead. I would like to say I agree with Victor everything you said there. That's exactly my thinking, that, that uh, there has to be a robust notice, not some big 20-page document, not something scrolling by in a little box online, for example. Th this is why I keep emphasizing robust notice is the most important. Well, I, I, I don't know what, how you define robust notice, but I know, uh, I know you should have to check the box that says, I want you to be able to do this, okay, and no implied consent. It has to be robust, I want to do this consent. And, and anything short of that, I think, is a violation of what most Americans understand as their right to privacy. Um, Ms. Cooper, I have a question for you. Some, some people might not know, one of my constituents has released a new record, uh, Girl Talk. He's a mashup uh, DJ, released this new album, Feed the Animals, uh, on the Internet. And he's charging like Radiohead, like it's, it's, it's pay whatever you want. Now, if, if record companies and, and uh, other companies encourage ISPs to use deep packet inspection for tracking copyrighted content and, and punishing copyright infringers, is it reasonable to worry that the technology would also scoop up consumers of, of lawful content and, and other fair uses of copyrighted material? Well, I will say that I'm a huge fan of Girl Talk, and I did download the most recent album at a very low price, uh, happily, <laughs> for my pocketbook. But I think you've hit the nail on the head, which is that using technologies like deep packet inspection for applications like copyright filtering raise the question of how to know when you recognize a copyrighted work whether it's an authorized use of that work or not. And the technology itself of inspecting the packets, assembling the packets into uh, a piece of data that you could recognize as a copyrighted work cannot tell you whether a use is authorized or not. That's a judgment that needs to be made by a person, perhaps multiple people. It depends on the context. It depends on if, if it's a fair use or not. And so the the you cannot rely simply on this technology to be able to say, uh, yes, this is uh, an Ill illegal use of someone's work, or no, it's not. Mm -hmm. Dr. Reed, uh, first of all, thank you for your years of service to the Internet. Uh, tell me, I think you touched on this briefly. Uh, well, deep packet inspection, don't, don't you think this is really just going to uh, lead to an encryption arms race and, and where everybody's just going to start to encrypt their packets to avoid detection? And, and what do you think the impl impl implications of that would, would be to the Internet if that starts to happen? Um, well, first of all, it would be a great boon for the, the sellers of encryption technology. <laughs> yeah. um, but but the, uh, um, I, th I think it would raise the, the barrier for many applications because it's not simple to design actually secure encryption technologies. Although the basic idea of, of encrypting a packet from end to end is easy, the, 
handing out of keys so that, it, it, you know, specific keys to the right set of people that need to receive that stuff is quite complex and, and um, depends on a, on a notion of a key distribution network which would then have to exist over the top of the internet um, because everyone would need to get their keys reliably from reliable sources. So it would create a rather elaborate network structure for distribution of keys and security of those keys that is not currently in place to make it actually work. I've been involved in the research on that topic since, actually since about the same time the internet started, um, and industry has not succeeded in doing it, partly because the demand has not been there, the expectation of privacy was good enough, but, um, but also for two other reasons. One is the reason that um, there is a public interest in not having the too, much, too strong encryption for law enforcement reasons. Um, you want to be able to not depend on breaking the keys, but hope that the bad guys will do something bad um, for at least discovering bad things. And then the other, the other reason is that the actual physical security of those keys and physical distribution involves trust relationships that don't exist in society today. Who would you trust to get your key from? Um, maybe you'd trust your, your ISP, maybe not. Thank you. One last question. Mr. Dykes, uh, y your testimony says basically that, that when I surf the web uh, and, and I don't opt out, I, I give you implied consent to share everything that's, uh, uh, that I do. And that's, that's a one-sided consent. But Pennsylvania, uh, where I come from, requires both ends of a conversation to consent to any wiretaps. Uh, your service listens to all web conversations that uh, you've sought or obtained consent from, from millions of people, if not billions of, of web pages and content providers. Uh, if, if you've not specifically obtained consent from all these millions of, of uh, web page and content providers, why do you think that, that your service doesn't violate Pennsylvania's wiretap law or why it wouldn't apply to you? Um, sir, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I've spoken to my lawyers, and they've not identified any legal barriers to our entry in, in, in any states, but we'd be happy to work with you or your staff to go through that in more detail. I see my time's up, Mr. Um, Mr. Dole, can I make a comment? General, I'm sorry, the gentleman's time has expired. I'm sorry. Uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Radanovich. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, for this hearing. And uh, I, I do have a question of uh, Dr. Reed. Uh, Mr. Cleland gave a, uh, what I thought was a very interesting analogy about on dealing with ISPs and uh, dealing, trying to perfect the window shade when in a, uh, on a window with a house with no walls. What's your, can you, would you respond to his comments about the difference between search engines and ISPs? And I'd be curious to know your comments on that. Um. Well, I could respond on different on different levels. Um, I I agree with um, Mr. Cleland that there are strong concerns about the amount of private information that is captured and, and used by uh, search engine companies and and others, and that there needs to be some thought given to that scale of collection. It's a different kind of collection because it's captured by a site that that you go to. But in the case of Google. For example, I, I know that they're kind of the only game in town for a certain kind of thing, not because of a, a law mandate, but because they're really good, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, so, um, so I, I see this particular focus on the transport part as relevant to this committee, and, and I'm not really prepared to talk about the technology inside Google much further than that. All right, thank you. Mr. Cleland, do you have a, a solution for this? Is it, uh, is it uh, one type of of is it DPI, is it cookies, is, what's your answer to all this? Well, well this, uh, thanks for the question. It also allows me to also respond to Mr. Doe and what he had, what he had said is um, there's a holistic problem here with privacy. And um, don't be fooled of thinking that there's only one way to be tracked or there's only one way for somebody to violate your privacy. Now, packets going through, you know, the, the, the expectation is, is these packets should be delivered and not uh, inter interfered with. Okay, uh, okay that's understood. Now, what you do when you're not an ISP, like when you're a Google or a Yahoo or these others, and they want to track you, they track clicks. Now, they can do the same thing. You said you didn't want to know if somebody went to the prostate cancer page. Well, there's a packet that could um, transmit that or a click. So there's more than one way to skin a cat. And the problem here is, is that 
you're focusing only on broadband deep packet inspection as one way to invade your privacy and turning a complete blind eye to the way that you can track clicks and a myriad of other ways that you can glean the same information and actually potentially a whole lot more. Does, it, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, it does. I, um, uh, Ms. Cooper, I'd, I'd like to get a comment from you too as well. On, uh, do you recognize the advantage of DPI in, in as far as the, the, the potential protection of piracy and those issues as well, the, the value of something like DPI? So I think the DPI does have some beneficial uses, and uh, but one that c comes to mind immediately is for detection of network attacks, viruses, spam, distributed den denial of service attacks and those sorts of things where um, having an, an ISP might have an indication that an attack is coming from a certain IP address or from a certain location and being able to look a little bit more deeply into the packets can help to thwart those kinds of attacks. So I certainly think that DPI has some beneficial uses, but I really think it needs to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis where you can weigh the risks against the benefits and uh, evaluate the, the other protections around how it's deployed with the notice and, the, and the, what the limits are on the data collection. So I really think it's a, it's, a, it's a neutral technology. I don't think it's a good or a bad technology, as most technologies are, but I think it, it deserves a contextual evaluation. Consumers have to be able to check the box, basically, and say... Well, in, in, in some cases, yes. I think yeah. you know if you can you can imagine certain applications of DPI that you would only want to have uh, consumers you know fully informed and consenting to, and and other examples like the with the spam example, um, if you had to consent every time your ISP or your email provider blocked a spam for you, uh, that might be something that you would only want to consent to once, or you know the the model would probably look different. So I really think it's it deserves a case-by-case -case evaluation. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, let me preface this uh, question with, with a story. And actually, the uh, reporter's name is Luis Story, uh, January in, out of, uh, I think it was New York Times. In January 2008, 14.6 billion searches were conducted. Yahoo, Google, Microsoft, AOL, and MySpace record at least 336 billion transmission events in a month, not counting their networks. Yahoo has most data collection points in a month on its own sites, about 110 billion collections, or 811 for the average user, plus 1,709 other opportunities to collect data about, av uh, about the average end of the person on partner sites such as eBay at which Yahoo sells the ads. So my question, should privacy rights and obligations begin and end at the doors of the ISPs solely? Ms. Cooper, just a yes or no. I mean, should, that's, should we only be, and I know that my colleague from California touched on it, should that be our only concern? Do privacy rights and obligations that we seek to protect and impose on all players really begin and end only at the doors of the ISPs? Just a yes or no. No, we should have comprehensive privacy protections. Mr. Dykes? I agree. We should have comprehensive privacy protection that's technology neutral. Dr. Reed? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Savitt? Uh, yes. One, one. Hey, if you turn on, please. Yes, one, one point, by the way, is Dr. Reed agrees with my definition from Wikipedia <laughs> offline. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Clellan? It should be holistic. It shouldn't just be on ISPs. All right. And I know that we're concentrating on certain technology utilized by ISPs, but I would hope that no one leaves this room today or a viewer or a listener thinks that this committee is not concerned about the overarching responsibility and duty that we wish to impose on everyone out there. And now whether, and, and Mr. Doyle is saying it, it's in other jurisdiction, uh, but we're actually discussing many things that may go way outside of the jurisdiction of this committee and such, but nevertheless, you're going to have a collaboration along the way. It seems to me that everyone is, the, the holy grail here 
is some sort of an opt-in as opposed to what we generally follow in other models of an opt-out. Uh, an affirmative act saying that you will agree after there is full and, as, Mr. as the Chairman indicated, clear and conspicuous disclosure, which we all agree on, and then some affirmative act. In this case, it would be an opt-in. So there's different ways to opt-in. And I'm just wondering, and I'll be asking a couple of the witnesses if they would agree that this would be adequate and sufficient across the board, whether it's an ISP or an application company. What if they were able to obtain the opt-in in the following manner? One, they would tell the consumer, check this box, whether it's on the screen or whatever, or an envelope saying, after full disclosure, conspicuous, clear language, or simply using the service will be interpreted as an opt-in. Would you be satisfied, Ms. Cooper, with an arrangement simply using the, servi the service would be an affirmative act of opting in to all conditions and terms of the provider? I think it depends on the service. I, don't, I think at times affirmative express consent is absolutely necessary, and at other times it's not. I think it is, it's dependent upon the data being collected, the sensitivity of the data, the laws that we have in place. All of those things are important to the decision. We would have to have different not. standards on that type of opt-in language depending on the type of information that is being gathered. I just think that may be an impossible task. I'm not sure. Dr. Reed, would you be satisfied with that kind of an opt-in arrangement? Simply using the service equates to an affirmative act of opting in. No, um, not, not in the case of ISP access to the Internet. Well, no, I'm talking about everyone that should have responsibility and duty to safeguard this pr uh, particular information when they gather it and making sure there's full disclosure to the consumer that it is being collected and shared. What does I it matter whether it's going <laughs> to whether it's Embark or whether it's Google. It's still my information, one, full disclosure, two, an adequate opt-in process. Why are we making that distinction is the real curious question. I think, for the most part, you all have, uh, you know, distinctions without differences. It's whether we have, maybe because of the scope of the, of the technology and the ISP status, you're saying, well, that's a mortal sin. We'll let everyone get away with venial sins. Well, I hate to tell you, I think the consumer is just going to be concerned with the tremendous information out there that may constitute a lesser sin. But there, it's still a sin. And by the way, all of these, all these sinners are all worshiping at the common altar of the advertising dollar, which promotes and supports the entire system, whether you are a network, ISP, or an applica application company. And that's the reality. And I know, that I think the chairman has been very reasonable and generous with me, and he's let me go over my amount of time, and I yield back. Right. Gentleman's time has expired. Um, gentleman, gentle lady from uh, California, Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, yet another um, substantive hearing on uh, an all-important issue. Uh, it's great having you be chair, because uh, that's what we've done since you've taken over. Uh, so thank you, and thank you to all the witnesses. Um, first of all, um, I can't help but think of the following with my uh, intelligence committee cap on, and that is that the penultimate intelligence is to know how people think. And I think that that applies to a lot of what we're talking about here. Uh, I think that users should be notified in the most meaningful way on what information is being collected, how it's being used, how they can opt out of certain forms of data collection. And I think that medical uh, information collected really should be treated uh, as, uh, as one of the most sensitive um, or, or the most uh, uh, sensitive data. So I, I just want to state that. Um, I apologize for coming in um, later than, uh, than other members, but it gave me the opportunity to um, to read um, uh, what we didn't have yesterday, and that is some of the testimony. Um, uh, Mr. Cleland, uh, I derive from your testimony, from your statement, that you are not for net neutrality. Is that, uh, that's, that's pretty e exactly. obvious. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not for net neutrality. Uh, let, let me ask you uh, this. 
are you um, are you paid any consulting fees by uh, as any I of the bells as or I, cable or anyone? As I disclosed when I came in here, I'm testifying on my own behalf. However, uh, another hat I wear anyone, is I work for uh, I'm chairman of NetCompetition.org. It's uh -huh. a organiz a pro competition that is funded by wireless telecom and cable uh, companies. So that is so well known. So the answer known. is yes. Yes, yeah, I've good. always disclosed okay. well, it in every place I wasn't here when you go. disclosed that. So yes, I'm yes. glad to hear that. And Absolutely, I think it's always important full disclosure. And I think it's important to highlight it for the record. I think that's um, good. Now, on, um, uh, in your statement, you said that broadband companies are subject to Section 222, the Communications Act. Um, now, I, I think for the record, we need, to, we need to clarify this. Because for telephone services, that's so, but not for broadband service. You agree with that? Well, um, where, where we are is in an evolution on that in the sense of telecom Well, I mean, just yes or no. We don't have no, to No, because it's a very evolutions. complicated question in I mean, the sense it's, that it's, law enforcement and other things have been applied. It's very important about the obligations under 222. They are uh, a telephone services uh, come under that obligation, but broadband services do not. So uh, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm uh, differing with you in terms of what's in your statement. So we're just going to leave it at that. Um, now, le let me get to this whole issue of how we, how we achieve the kind of privacy and the implementation of that as all of this continues to be broadened out. Uh, because the internet is going to keep growing. There always are going to be new ways of getting to people, uh, trying to attract them to buy things, to sell things. Uh, but we don't want uh, that used against them. So uh, let me ask uh, uh, you, Mr. Dykes, um, do you think that there should be legislation that provides a statutory framework uh, for what data can be collected, uh, how it can be used, and how consumers can either opt in or opt out of the collection? Yes, I do. You do? Yes, absolutely. I said in my testimony, we, we definitely support uh, a, a base privacy law across all industries that's technology neutral. That would definitely address that. Let me ask the whole panel this. I, I, I'm concerned that, uh, that greater innovations in network capacity, data speeds, um, storage, uh, and that more data containing potentially harmful software will be encrypted um, and then escape the current network of, um, of firewalls. Um, is this a legitimate fear? Uh, uh, I mean, should in, government in, be addressing this? It, it, so I mean, each one of you, however yeah. you well, want. Uh, well, in my, in my view, uh, no, it isn't. The, the Internet today operates in a, uh, where, with secure sites such as banks uh, that, that do, uh, for the most part, display their information in a secure manner. And, and that is appropriate because there really isn't, uh, people shouldn't be looking at that data, and it doesn't really have commercial value for advertisers anyway. In, in other areas where it is a travel site, you know, the innocuous character, uh, uh, categories that we track, such as travel or automotive, for example, those are also subject to the search engines wanting, to, and they want the search engine to know that, that they have those subjects. And so there is a natural process for sites to not want to be secure so that, in fact, can be part of the search process and, and other links, et cetera. And so but I don't know from your right. answer whether this is a legitimate fear on my well, part. Well, well my, my, my point is that I, I the, the, actually Mr. Reid previously expressed that fear and, and I, what I'm saying is that I don't think that that is a, a fear because we keep our, our characterizations at a sufficiently high level that uh, people are not going to be fearful and, and that is why we have to continue to, to publicize this, that we have very strong privacy controls, uh, no personally identifiable information and we're only tracking innocuous uh, uh, categories mapped against those uh, 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 anonymous profiles. General, yeah, General Lady's time. Thank has you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can I just make a very quick observation? I, it's the first time in telecommunications uh, testimony that we've uh, that J. Edgar Hoover has come into it. I don't know whether you're, Mr. Cleland, referring to some kind of cross telecom cross dressing or what. But, uh, <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I just wanted to uh, I just there, wanted to make that uh, there is a picture uh, highlight of, that notation. There is a picture the of Sergey Brin cross dressing on the net. That's all right. I think I think we get where you are. Of him thank at a party. Uh, I thank the uh, gentlelady. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, want to applaud you for having this uh, very important hearing. When I read about uh, the background on this, of course I'm concerned, uh, coming from California where we have, I think, a lot of stricter uh, rules in place that, that uh, look at two-party wiretapping. And I, would, I want to get feedback from uh, Ms. Cooper and Mr. Dykes on that and how, you're, how you are going to deal with states like mine. But I have a couple of questions, too, concerns. One is um, you're, you're able to profile who, who I am because I go on the Internet. You can see what my likes, dislikes, or whatever. Um, but what about those people that may, may have language barriers or that may be senior citizens who who could be gullible to specific type of unscrupulous advertisers or individuals who, who at a certain point can determine maybe some vulnerabilities. And people in my community, Latinos and others uh, at a certain age, what, what have you, could be uh, vulnerable to folks that take advantage of them and specifically targeting advertisements at them which we know happens now even in the print media and television, but mostly print, uh, many in our community are taken advantage of. I'm, I'm concerned about predatory type of uh, movement that could happen and, and you know, how we detect that and how we can really help consumers who are maybe not language literate or because they speak, a mo they're, mono, they're monolingual, they only speak maybe Spanish, how, how you address that. So, um, I want to ask Ms. Cooper if you can talk about what I've raised, but those are some of the concerns that I'm thinking about out loud right now. Thank you. I think, I think the concern that you raise is legitimate, and, and the broader context in which we've discussed uh, this concern is how these behavioral profiles that are getting created about consumers are really used. It's one thing to uh, you know, target a car ad to someone who's been interested in, in buying cars, but it's another thing to abuse the profiles as you're talking about, to target vulnerable populations or to, to use the profiles for de decisions about things like credit or employment and insurance or insurance. And because there's, it's kind of a black box and we don't really know all of the ways that these profiles are being used and it's, and it, it's, it's really invisible to the consumer. They, as we've discussed already, don't even know that this kind of tracking is going on. But even if they do know, it's, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, for them to find out what the profile says, who, who's, who it's been sold to, who else is using it, how it's being used. And so I think we still have a lot of work to do to find out what all of those secondary uses are and, and who is conducting them. And, and if that's even okay, if I, I think if, a, if information is collected for one particular purpose, even if consumers are informed and they opted into that, that doesn't mean that there's a license to use it for all these other purposes. Can you address the two-party wiretapping issue? Some sure. So there are some states like California whose wiretapping laws require consent from both parties to the communication. So on the Internet, that would be both the consumer and the website that the consumer is visiting. Um, in, the, in the context of the wiretapping laws, there's not a lot of case law about how those apply specifically to the internet. There are, there are phone, telephone cases, mm -hmm. and in some cases, if you, have a, if you have a call going from one state to another, the one party consent state trumps, so the, there's only needs to be consent from one party. If you have a call coming from a, a two party state to a one, a one party state, in, Cal in California, uh, there is some case law that, that shows that you still need consent from both parties, but it has only been applied in the telephone context. So, so would you uh, encourage us, as uh, our subcommittee kind of molds through this, to look at potential a framework or something that, that could address this issue? Absolutely. I mean, there, there is the, the, the federal wiretapping laws on the books, which we think are, uh, are fairly clear on their application to this model, but as we've been discussing today, there are all these other kinds of data collection going on which don't fall under that framework, and we certainly think that's uh, a, an area of work good for this committee. We have 17 seconds. I'm sorry, Mr. Dykes. Uh, 
Uh, well, on, on your first question, I agree with Ms. Cooper. Uh, it really is the responsibility of all advertisers and advertising companies to uh, have responsible behavior. And so the questions that you raise are really not specific to ISP-based advertising because, as the panel has noted, there's lots of this data is collected in many ways. And so, for example, as an industry, we don't advertise to, to and the law requires us not to advertise to children, for example. And so, but, but uh, as responsible advertisers, we, we observe the types of concerns that you have, and, and, and uh, I don't think we, uh, people in our industry would cross them, uh, you know, responsible companies. With regard to your second question, um, as, as I said previously, uh, you know, I have spoken to my lawyers on that, and they've, uh, they've not identified any legal barrier to operating in, in, uh, in any state, but we'd be happy to work with your staff to, to further elaborate on that. You said something earlier, though, that business has a legitimate role because they're paying for this, for this access. Um, so how do you then, where do, where do you draw the line to say that maybe some of these folks that are paying may, may not be, um, how could I say, um, honest in, in the way that they are targeting, for example, alcohol and tobacco? I mean, there are certain populations that we know industries target. Mm -hmm. I mean, who's, to, you know, those are questions that I have concerns about. So, so the way that's generally uh, 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 handled is that the industry, through its industry associations, uh, certifies certain companies to say that we act responsibly, we, we, we operate within these standards, and the advertisers advertise with companies who meet those standards. And so there is a role for, for, for the advertisers themselves to have some policing to only advertise with companies that operate in a responsible manner. And, and that, I think, is the effective way short of a law on the subject. Uh, Self-policing does occur in this industry and I think has been reasonably effective. General lady's time has expired. The gentleman from uh, Florida has uh, an just additional a, question. Just uh, two questions, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, the first is just to clarify, uh, the gentlelady lady from California brought up, uh, Mr. Cleveland, uh, what his invested interest was, he disclosed it. And I think uh, just to set the record straight, Ms. Cooper, uh, since the gentlelady brought up funding, I note that according to CDC records, your organization received almost 10 percent of its funding from e-commerce companies uh, such as Google and Yahoo. I just wanted to confirm that. Are you still receiving funding from these companies? We are. We actually have a, a very broad base of funding. It's about 50 percent from foundations and 50 percent from high-tech companies, all kinds of different high-tech companies. Including Google and Yahoo. Yes. Yeah. And Mr. Dykes, I think this uh, discussion we did, had today, and I commend the chairman for having this hearing, I think it's very enlightening, and I think you can sense from everybody's uh, feelings that uh, people are concerned that uh, these deep pockets of information uh, packets that you're going into without anybody knowing about it uh, is a concern. Maybe you should just summarize and tell us this information you're seeking. What is it that everybody's getting so alarmed about? So maybe you would allay their fears by just outlining, uh, just very simply, what is this thing that you're? What is the stuff that you're looking at? Uh, the end result is is simply the, uh, our noting that an anonymous profile qualifies for certain innocuous categories, such as travel, automotive other subjects like that. So the very innocuous categories, because we don't want to get into sensitive subjects, uh, you know, uh, pharmaceutical ads, for example, we stay away from the sensitive subjects. So it's innocuous categories mapped against anonymous profiles is the end result. And, uh, and that's why- Well, Mr. Doyle mentioned health information, going to look for prostate cancer. We avoid that. I mean, how do we know that you avoid that? I mean, we just take well, your word that, for it? Uh, well, that is, that is one of the reasons why we are, uh, are having our system audited uh, so that you know, a big four firm can actually say that, yes, they do what they say they do. So that's one important element. The other is uh, industry standards around sensitive subjects that they are still somewhat being formed, but to the extent that uh, the FTC or other government bodies create uh, a greater definition around sensitive subjects, we certainly observe that. Meantime, we stay very, very conservative on, on that. Who, who is this auditing? Who, who, when you say you're audited, well, we, who by? We haven't, we haven't named uh, the firm, but we have indicated that we would have one of the big four audit firms Accounting audit firm. our systems uh, to ensure that we do what we say we do. And an accounting firm is going to audit well, you? Th those firms, 
correct. Those firms also do auditing of the subject as well, on privacy standards as well as accounting standards. I don't know if that's going to provide a degree of confidence to think that an accounting firm is going to audit you. They, they, there, there, there is such a thing to as... To determine whether you are going into sensitive boxes of information, <laughs> deep pockets, packets. I, I, I don't know, Mr. Dykes, whether that's going to... Uh, there, there, so there are the actually standards here. on privacy audits. There, there are actually standards on privacy have been created for privacy audits. And so you, you can't announce who that accounting firm is today? Uh, have you selected right. that have, person? Have you selected we, we, that? It hasn't been finally selected. So you don't even have an accounting firm doing it yet? Well, well you're, you're speculating that you will. Well, so we're a startup. So we're just, this, this is just, just the first the stage, early, the early, early stage. stage. Yeah. Can you try to pick a company, Mr. Dykes, that uh, wasn't the accounting firm for the subprime loan? Um, uh, a scandal off of the dot-com bubble, can, it, or the Enron. Can you find an accounting company that maybe has a good track record over the last six or seven years, yep. uh, not missing every major, major yep. accounting uh, scandal? And I, I don't know Your which company that might be, but I, we, we, uh, we, you'll be held responsible for anything they miss, by the way, which I unfortunately have to ask, say this, in most instances, the accounting firms miss the stuff that the industries want them to miss because they also have consulting contracts. It's not a good situation. Do any other members have um, uh, any uh, questions that they might want to toss? Yes, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. J just quickly, because <clears throat> as you can tell, I think we may have some differences of opinion on application and the exact answer, but make no mistake about it, I, we all really share the Chairman's concern regarding privacy and the duties and obligations that are out there because we truly believe the American public will be concerned about it. I don't want to overlook the fact that many consumers today are the beneficiaries of, quote, free services through application companies, and that's very, very valuable. He's on his third time. And the, the reason that they're free is because of advertising dollars, and we have to really understand the role of the advertising dollar out there in the internet <laughs> and how it has actually promoted its use and the quality of it and so on. And that, that can be a scary proposition depending on, on what we do. If we do act, I think we have to be careful uh, again about, about business models. And then going on what Mr. Savitt said uh, about broadband, and that is if those pipes are big enough and we keep increasing them, we take excuses away from people who may want to manage, one, manage them in a way that really deprives uh, the fair use of the Internet in the way Dr. Reed envisioned it and has envisioned it for a number of years. So we can't do anything, again, to impact or restrict the build-out of, again, I, I'm going to use the word robust in a different context, uh, of a broadband network, and that really does concern me. Lastly, I'm going to make that this last observation. Whether it's an ISP and how they got to where they are, or whether it's a Google and how they got to they are, whatever we come up with, I think we still have to acknowledge the reality of what Dr. Reed said. And But I'm going to go and use, real quick, Mr. Chairman, a quote, and this was in, re in regards to services by an ISP. And there's a, a Mr. Bob Williams who said there really should be an onus on the regulators to see this kind of thing is done correctly, meaning the information sharing and collection. And uh, Mr. Williams <coughs> deals with telecom and media uh, issues at Consumers Union. And this is what he said. He could have read some of the terms earlier when placing the order online, but he just clicked the accept button. Quote, I'm a hard-nosed consumer advocate type. I really should have examined it better than I did, he said. But he added he acted, acted like most consumers because of the lack of alternatives. Quote, you click the accept button because it's not like you're going somewhere else. And that's the backdrop, and that's the reality, and I believe that we will be acting responsibly, understanding those market forces. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Does the gentlelady from California have any additional uh, questions? So we're going to turn to our panel and we're going to ask each of you to give us your one-minute summary of what you want us to remember about this uh, issue of privacy um, and the American people. And uh, it might help if you get told us whether or not you thought opt-in was a good standard. I mean, we're talking privacy generally here, okay? not individual uh, companies, but just tell us about what do you think? Should that be the standard? Mr. Cleland. Uh, well, I, th I think that we need to have a holistic, comprehensive, balanced approach to privacy law. Is there, would uh, that be opt-in? 
Um, I, I think, uh, you know, one, uh, since you've asked, I think um, what the problem is when we now go to opt in or opt out, and it's that binary question, we're a little bit like the problem we have with do not call. And because it's complicated, we may end up with a do not track, where people just, because nobody's uh, minding what's going on in the internet, people get fed up and they say, well, just let me um, say somewhere that I don't want to be tracked with anybody. And so what, um, when we go with just opt in or opt out, what we're doing is we're basically making something that's not simple, real simple, when there's a lot of different ways to skin this cat. So I'm big on privacy, but they're, you know, one size doesn't fit all. But, um, but you do need to look at it comprehensively. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Sabat. Yeah, I mean, just uh, this quick summary here is um, I, we really believe that privacy and the open Internet are directly linked. And what you do with the data um, as, a, as a customer of, of DPI technologies is the key. So if you, use, if you violate people's privacy to, to manage the Internet, the open Internet, um, we think that's, that's the real harm here for consumers and the Internet ecosystem. Thank you. Dr. Reed. Well, I think opt-in is, is too glib. Um, it's, it really should be informed consent and understanding of what will happen to the information that you are, that are being tracked. And uh, in the case of the Internet, which for, where, for example, you can predict reliably the political affiliation and beliefs of somebody literally by who they're talking to. So if you could just monitor who they're talking to, you don't have to know whether they're a Democrat or a Republican. You actually um, have a much more complex notion of what you, you have to know what kind of analysis and use will be made of the information and what limits are placed on it, whether it's just for advertising, just for advertising by certain advertisers, just for something, as opposed to selling the unvarnished analytical information for any possible use. And that, that I think, is um, something that ought to be kept in mind. So start with opt-in, but go beyond it to opt-in to what? Okay, Mr. Dice. Uh, I, I think we need to recognize that the Internet today is more than 50 percent funded by advertising and to adopt an across-the-board opt-in rule would substantially reduce the value of the advertising across the Internet. So I think that the could, major harm could be uh, uh, incurred that way. So I think a more holistic view of it, but also a more fine-tuned view such that it was sensitive to the type of data being collected before we decide you know, what the rules should be, I think is the most appropriate way to, uh, to answer that. Uh, Ms. Cooper. I think consumers deserved to have informed, meaningful control over their data, whether it's opt-in or opt-out. Consumers need to be in the driver's seat with respect to what is happening to their data when they go online and when their data is existing offline. They need to be the ones who decide how their data gets to be used. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cooper, uh, very much. Um, you know, when people use the World Wide Web, they, they don't want it to turn into the wild, wild west when it comes to their uh, personal uh, information. And, and I think that this analogy which uh, Dr. Reed introduced today is a good one, okay? And, and it extends to the post office, it extends to uh, FedEx uh, or UPS, um, that, uh, that this is just another means of delivering. Uh, something that a consumer is interested in. And there should be a barrier that exists unless the uh, consumer determines that they do not want, uh, uh, that they do want, in other words, this uh, information to be compromised. Um, what we've learned from Embark and what we've learned from Charter uh, is that in their affiliation uh, with uh, Nebuad that uh, these questions weren't asked. Um, uh, from the get-go, uh, because this is a very serious subject. It's one that goes right to the heart of who we are as Americans. Uh, back in 1775, in my congressional district in Lexington, uh, one of the things that was just absolutely agitating the colonists was that the British thought they could come right into your home. Uh, there was no search warrant. There was no one that you know, could stop them and they could just come in. And so the very principles of individual freedom, individual liberty, uh, you are right uh, not to have uh, either the government or 
a private sector company coming into your life without your permission is central to who we are as Americans. That's what we fought for. That's what we continue to fight for uh, and try to spread around the rest of the world. We don't believe that either governments or private sector companies have a right to come in without your permission, unless there is a legally obtained warrant. And that's why we're talking about wiretapping laws here today. That's why we're talking about broad privacy laws that have been put on the books over the years. Uh, it is because it, has bec it is a subject uh, of, of constant um, uh, debate in our country from our, very from our very inception. So I think that what we're hearing today is strong sentiment um, from most members that clear notice and meaningful opt-in must be the standard by which cable and phone companies like Verizon or Comcast, to take the names of two companies that are more well known than Charter or Embark, but if this trend extends, uh, then that's who we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about these larger carriers uh, who will have the capacity uh, unless we have some standards uh, to be able to use this information as a product. Uh, and I don't think that Americans really want that to be the standard, notwithstanding the advertising base that uh, the Internet might be based upon. Uh, there might be a few companies that suffer if Americans decide that they don't want all of their information to just become uh, something that is put together as an advertising profile of that individual. Uh, that just is a price a little bit too high to pay uh, in order to have the Internet uh, there the way that a private sector company might want it to be there, in the same way that uh, politicians might want to know all of the private sentiments of voters in their district and be able to get access to it. We can't get access to it. Uh, we can hope that they are going to vote for us on Election Day, but there is a certain limit beyond which we can't go in intruding into the privacy of Americans. But it's a natural instinct. We would like to, each of us up here, would love to know everything that's going on in the homes of all 650,000 people in our district with regard to their political attitudes. That would be very helpful to us. But we can't. And there's a good reason why we can't. Uh, because uh, these individuals have a right to their privacy. And the same thing extends over to their right to privacy from advertisers, their right to say, no, I don't want you in my front door. When your mother is saying to you as uh, a little kid, when you tell the person knocking on the door they're not home, tell, tell them your mother's not home. Well, what are they really saying? They're saying, my mother, uh, uh, what your mother is really saying is, we're not home to you, sir, on the front door knocking, trying to get inside my home. Huh? And that's your right. And it should be your right as an American citizen not to let people inside your mail, inside your packages, inside your packets. This packet switch network that Dr. Reed and others invented uh, is something that really goes right to the heart uh, of, uh, and the principles that were established uh, really go right to the heart of who we are. And uh, Ranking Member Joe Barton, Chairman John Dingell, and I have already written to a cable and a phone company where either the notice or the opt-in choice was inadequate or missing. So we need to have remedial legal courses for some corporate general counsels. And, and we need to have the phone and the cable companies uh, step up and clearly say what their policies will be. And as I have proposed previously, we need a comprehensive online privacy bill uh, to close the gaps that exist with search engines and other sites. So we thank each of you for your testimony. We intend on working very closely. Uh, we intend on really raising the profile of this issue and any companies that are engaging in it uh, so they can become more famous, more well known uh, in terms of what they are doing. Uh, and this is only going to become an escalating um, uh, subject of attention uh, for this committee and for the Congress because anytime anyone learns about it, their first thought is, I didn't know that that was happening with all of my information. And that just, sheds, that just demonstrates that there has not been notice uh, given to people. So we thank all of you, and we intend on following up on this issue uh, in the months and years ahead. With that, this hearing is adjourned.
Here's a look at where the presidential candidates are today. Illinois Senator Barack Obama continues his family vacation in Hawaii.